Hello, and welcome to This Week in Hearing. I'm Gail Hannon. I'm a writer with hearinghealthmatters.org, and I'm also the author with Sherry Eberts of our recently published book, Here and Beyond, Live Skillfully with Hearing Loss. And our two guests today are doing just that. They have learned how to live well with their hearing loss. And I'm going to uh, do a brief introduction of them, and then we're, we're going to talk cochlear implants. So Lauren Deckard is the founder and owner of Peak Mobility, a holistic healing center in New Jersey. During her final semester of college, I thought it said first, final semester of college, Lauren unexpectedly lost her hearing. And adapting to her new reality took a physical and mental toll on her, especially when she was stuck in the corporate world. After being implanted with a cochlear nucleus seven device in her right ear, Lauren left the corporate world and started her own business in holistic healing, healing clients using the same methods she applied for her various ailments related to her hearing loss. Jill Rivoli was nine years old when she first realized that she couldn't hear the way everyone else could. Over the next 40 years, her hearing would continue to decline, resulting in complete deafness in her right ear and profound loss in her left ear. And although she was fitted with hearing aids, it wasn't until she received a cochlear implant that she was able to experience the hearing world again. Today, Jill is an assistant general manager at an historic working Montana ranch. And she's an avid hiker and horsewoman. And she's been able to rediscover the sounds of nature, like horses chomping on food, crickets, birds singing, water running in the stream, sounds that she had not heard from decades. So I am pleased to meet both of you. Um, and I know you don't know each other. So here we are, three women with cochlear implants. I got mine. Uh, so that we don't know each other, but we are going to get to know each other. So um, I just gave a little background on each of you, but um, I'd like to hear stories from you. So I'd like to start off by asking each of you, um, tell us a bit about your hearing journey and what led you to get a cochlear implant. So um, Jill, why don't you start? Um, thank you. Um, I'll start by saying it makes me a little teary to hear that and to have shared experiences with you women. So thank you. And thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, hearing aids just, uh, they weren't helping me very much. And I actually went, it's kind of funny that I went in to an audiologist and I said, Hey, my right hearing aid is not working very well. Can you fix it? And he said, uh, it's not the hearing aid. It's your ear. You have your, he used the word dead ear. You have a dead ear, which I don't like that saying, but, um, so I was really shocked and scared and, you know, not sure. I hadn't even really heard of cochlear implants before. Um, or you hear stories about little babies getting them. And I, I, it just didn't ever cross my mind that I was a candidate for that. And he mentioned that. And so I did get tested and um, I almost didn't do it. You know, when you think about surgery and implanting something in your, you know, head and, you know, it's scary. It was, you know, I, I thought about it for a little while. And then I thought, you know, I don't have much to lose. I certainly don't have any hearing to lose. And if I can you know, if there's something available that can help me, then, then I'm going to give it a go and give it a chance. And, um, it, it has changed how I function in the world. It has given me back more of a social life. And I, I would not be able to function at the level, you know, I'm a executive level and luxury, you know, guest ranch and resort. I, I would not be able to do it without my cochlear implant. It has, it has definitely made, there's still challenges for sure, but it has definitely made me able to navigate my business life and professional life um, much, much easier. And um, yeah, it's been a game changer for me. How long did it take you to make the decision? Like, was it a, a year or was it days or? Um... It was, it probably wasn't that long. It was really probably maybe six months. I thought about it and did some research. Cause like I said, I really didn't know anything about it. And um, and then I met with a couple of different surgeons at a couple of different places. I'd been moving around and I, and I ended up really liking the surgeon. It, uh, I had my surgery at Stanford university in California and I really liked him and trusted him and, and, um, 
yeah. And then just, and then I, once I made the decision, I was frustrated that I couldn't get surgery faster. So, <laughs> Isn't you know, that always a process to go through? Yeah. Great. So um, Lauren, tell us about uh, your hearing journey and what took you up to the point of uh, making that decision and getting a cochlear implant. No, oh, sure. So I lost it originally when I was 21. And like, like you said, it was my last semester in college. And that's supposed to be like, you know, your carefree fun times. And I did not have any of those times until I was able to actually like get my implant. Um, so they first gave me, when I first lost it, they gave me um, hearing aids and similar, similar situation. Uh, they just wouldn't, well, they weren't working for me. They worked for about a year and then the audiologist couldn't explain why I kept losing my hearing for the next three years at least. Um, and then when I was 25, um, I was pregnant with my son and um, I also did a little bit of bouncing around for, for to find somebody I was comfortable with. Obviously, I didn't want to have the surgery while I was pregnant, um, but it made me realize being pregnant, I was like, I'm not going to be able to like hear his little voice and I'm not going to be able to. And I really wasn't functioning because at that time, too, I was in the corporate world. So people would call me. Unfortunately, at that time, people would expect me to use the phone. Um, because things, you know, like Zoom existed, but it wasn't the same thing as it was now. Um, you know, like uh, uh, chat text-based for businesses existed, but no one really used it. So you were kind of forced to use the phone and I just couldn't do it. So it was, for lack of a better word, it was kind of like humiliating. I mean, like I, I struggled really hard and that was really, really hard to do like in the business world. So between that and then getting ready to have my son, I was like, you know, this time like I, I I don't wanna I don't wanna feel like I'm so out of sorts with everybody else. I don't wanna feel included. Um so finally I had my son. I waited a year until you know um you know, breastfeeding everything finished and um the surgeon was one of the surgeons I met with he was so nice and he didn't have any hearing loss himself but it felt like he did because he could like pinpoint exactly how I felt. And I was like, do whatever, cut me open. I don't care. Do whatever you need to do. <laughs> um, because it just, it was so nice to find somebody who just understood what it really felt like. And that was hard to find as I went around to everybody. Um, so I was really thankful that, that I went that route and, and, and uh, chose him. That's wonderful. Both of you really put a lot of uh, not just thought, I mean, clearly with declining hearing, I mean, you've got, I can just live with no hearing or I'm, it's time to do something about it, but you really put a lot of work into finding someone you were comfortable with. And that's not always the case. Um, so I, I really applaud you on that. That's, uh, that's amazing that, that you're clearly both very motivated women. So, um, I, I love hearing people's stories, you know, as a writer and as an advocate. I mean, that's how we learn to live better with our hearing loss is when we can, you know, talk to people and get information. And in your case, from some really good professionals, wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about that period after implantation, because I think, Jill, you mentioned you were nervous about it. You're putting something into your head and it wasn't the experience, you know, that we, we didn't know lots of people with that, if, if you're like me. So, um, Talk, tell me a little bit about after the surgery and even right up through the switch on. Tell me about that experience. Was, what was it surprising or, yeah, you know, just tell me how you felt. So, Jill? Jo Actually, I joined a lot of Facebook pages for cochlear implant recipients and users. And so I was actually expecting the surgery to be worse than it was. Um, I didn't have a lot of drainage. I don't, you know, because you see some people with the scars, you know, like this, and mine was just behind the ear. Um, so the surgery actually went, you know, easier than anticipated. And I, um, yeah, I came back from that pretty quickly. And then I don't, I actually don't remember that much between surgery and switch on. Like, I don't even remember how much switch time, on, yeah. Yeah. Um, time that is, but with switch on, I also had done a lot of research about what to expect. And, you know, everybody said, you're not going to hear normally right away. I think that's the biggest misconception that people have about a cochlear implant or even hearing aids is that you hear normally again. Um, it is not normal. And I, I did a lot of, um, like I had apps on my phone and on my computer, um, where it would play 
sounds. I don't know if you both did this, but it would play different sounds. And then almost like a game, I would guess which, you know, is that running water? Is that a dog barking? Is that a person talking or is that a car honking? And at first I could not tell the difference between any of them. And it was a little scary. Like, I don't know what that noise is, but, but I, I recovered or I, I started training my brain really very quickly. And I think within six months, I had gone from, you know, very, very, very low listening comprehension to in the 90%. And I had my doctors and my audiologists tell me like, there's some people have cochlear implants their whole lives and they never get um, that good of listening comprehension. So it, so obviously I was a good candidate for it and it worked for me, but it's still, you know, people that know me, I'll be like, what's that noise? Like if my brain doesn't know already what it is, it, it takes me a minute to, like even jets flying over, if I can't see it, I'm like, what is that noise? And people will tell me. And then my brain kind of goes, oh yeah. Okay. We know what that is now, but it's, it's been um, a journey for sure. But I, I will say that I, I think the time from when I got turned on to when I was actually hearing in a, in a way that was really helpful to me, was very short compared to a lot of people from what my understanding is, but, um, but yeah, it was kind of scary and it was, you know, mine sounded like, I hear people say some sound like Minnie Mouse or Darth Vader. Mine kind of sounded more like people talking sounded like Minnie Mouse with the Darth Vader helmet on, maybe. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was it was kind of scary and, and weird. And it took a while to, um, to get used to that. So yeah, that's kind of how that right. happened for me. Yeah. And all the emotions that go along with that. Yes, and, you know. yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, how about you, Lauren? I think I I remember, so this fall will be my fifth year that I had it. So what I remember is like two weeks. So after surgery, the recovery part was actually kind of difficult for me just because I had, um, I can't remember what they're called, like those little crystal particles. So I had to do a lot of PT because I, my vertigo was so bad for like two weeks. Oh, yeah. Um, That that was no one's fault, just how my body reacted, um, which was awesome because yeah, I had it like uh, I had my surgery at Hopkins in Baltimore, and when I went back, um, I'm also allergic to anesthesia. So my poor surgeon was like, w- "Like, what's wrong with you?" <laughs> but it's all just comes down to me. But I had to use those goggles. I can't remember what they're called, but they're like for vertigo, and they um, they project my eye patterns on this huge screen. And he watches to make sure, like. I can't even describe it, but it was like the craziest experience. And really it just came down to him like giving me a couple of different exercises, which again was cool to get me into like the holistic world. Um, and that really like expelled these pieces in my inner ear. And then I was fine after that. Um, I think they didn't allow me to use any like hearing aids or anything afterwards while you were just healing and they didn't want to uh, like confuse it before activation, I think. Um, and as soon as I did, it was just like, just like you were saying, it was, for me, it was Minnie Mouse for like two weeks. And when I was still in the, the corporate world, I had like, uh, like the CEO of the company was like, really like, he's like a tough guy. Um, you know, like nobody messes with him and he'd come in and ask me a question. And I would just try so hard not to crack up. It sounded like a teeny little Minnie Mouse, but no one else could like hear it or explain it. But um so it was kind of, it was, an, I'm just glad it didn't stick around, but like for a two week period, it was like an entertain, like entertainment in my own head. <laughs> so are you, are you bimodal? Again? Do, do you have a cochlear implant and a hearing aid in the other one? No, I, um, I'm actually, so I could get it on my second side, but I just, I just don't want to do it yet. Um, so I just have it in my right ear. And then like what I don't, I could get it in my left, but I feel like I can't describe the sensation because I know I can't hear anything on this side, but by having it on this side, I feel like I can hear everything, if that makes sense. There is some sort of pass through something. That, yeah, yeah. And I can't explain. I'm not an audiologist. Or, no, right. I, I, I don't know the science and that's okay because other people do. You know, I remember when I got a uh, switch on and I was back uh, to my father's house, my husband took me back. I, I had it done in, in a different province from where I live. Um, long story and we walked into the house and I heard this sound and went, nyuk, nyuk, nyuk. and I said what what's that what's that sound and my husband said it's the clock my dad had one of those old-fashioned oh, yeah. and 
He said, can you hear it? I said, yes, I can. And he goes, everybody, Gail can hear the clock. And I went, <laughs> I went, could you turn it down? So yes. but it, technical sounds I could hear even now better, but voices, my sister sounded exactly like my husband. So there was that uh, time to, to eventually I could start male, female. And, and of course I, I'd been a lifelong speech reader. So I tried not to speech read, but so it was really, everyone's situation is different. And uh, like you, I had, it was up to 90% in a while, I, um, but I'm bimodal. So I wear a hearing I aid. Too. You are. Okay. Yeah. So, and in some way, so if I have just my cochlear implant, it's not so good. Just my hearing aid, it's not so good. They have to be working together because that's what my brain has learned to do. So it, it's kind of an interesting concept. So I was going to ask you how do things sound with your cochlear implant, but you've already told me that. Tell me a bit more about those sounds. So what even today? So it's been five years for you, Lauren, and how long for you, Jill? Four. four? Was that four? That's like a little <laughs> kid. I'm, I fart now. Yeah. <laughs> fart. Um, so, and I am five, so we're all kind of in the same. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me what sounds you still find challenging, uh, if any, or situations. You know. The most challenging situations for me are still restaurants or many people in a room talking at one time, which does, you know, happen with my job. Um, I'm, I'm single. And I don't have kids. And so I live by myself, which is wonderful. And as far as hearing goes, you know, I don't have to struggle to hear anybody. Um, I do a lot of hiking and horseback riding and things by myself. And I, so the other challenge I think is I used to lead horseback rides into the wilderness and I don't do that anymore really because I can't hear behind me, even with my cochlear implant and my hearing aid, if there's somebody on a horse behind me, they're you know, 10, 15 feet behind me, I, I really still struggle with that. So, um, and I would say similar, like um, voices are still challenging. I, I don't, sorry, I'm kind of jumping around, but um, like you, Gail, my, like sometimes my battery will die in my hearing aid and I'll be like, oh, I just have my cochlear implant. But, you know, so it's a little bit more of a struggle but I can, I can hear, and, or if I just have my hearing aid, same thing. It's like really both of them together, what helps me. And the, the greatest thing, the greatest invention for me is this, you know, I stream directly to my hearing aid and my cochlear implant and, and they're joined together. So otherwise, like you were saying, Lauren, I, I can't talk on the phone without it. Every time I start a new job, they say, oh, here's your phone extension. And I have to say, I, I can't talk on the phone. Um, and here they've actually rerouted my extension. So it will go directly to my cell phone, which helps. But, but so to summarize, telephone is number one. I just still can't do it. And then, you know, restaurants, loud places with lots of people talking all at once is, is still very challenging. Well, guess what? The hearing people, the people we call them, they have a challenge uh, in yeah, restaurants with lots yeah. of people. It, 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 uh, it's a situation. What about you? Uh, Lauren, what sounds are still difficult? And then I really actually want to hear what have you got back? What is what's just brilliant about what you're here now? So I think, well, so I live at the beach. So really like the hardest thing is probably hearing people outside um, with the wind. You can't escape the wind, which oh, yeah. hearing aids, anything alike, even hearing people have trouble with it. So I just have to like position myself because the wind is like always changing, like bay side, ocean side. So I literally just have to keep positioning myself around people so um, I can hear <laughs> yes, them. I do. Uh, the only thing that's been harder, um, but kind of like we re still retraining my brain is like so obviously like I could hear fairly fine um, until I was twenty one. So I still remember, I don't, I couldn't name any of like the popular anything right now, but my brain still remembers all of those like 91 hit wonders and like Pink Floyd and everything that I used to listen to. So it's still like, you don't have the same, um, the same richness of sound like I remember from when I was a kid. So I think like the music is probably the hardest. Like I still try to enjoy it, but like, 
I mean, nothing exists to have that many channels to get the same acoustic as, you know. Um, so that's kind of hard. And then of course, like, as you said, restaurants or bars, I just, I'm not a big person to go out anyway, so I'm good. <laughs> um, yeah, those are just the tricky situations, really. Yeah, music or, is something when I'm listening to music and it's bimodal, this, especially once I got the tune, once I got it, you know, it takes a minute, but I've got it. And in, in my cochlear implant side, it sounds like that relative who starts singing along and it's off tune and it's off key. Yes. It's like you're listening to two different songs completely. And I know there's things that, that um, this is an issue and that technology and all these new generations of technology, it'll get better. Um, but it, uh, music is, is something that's, and it's a big grief for people losing music. And I just decided that I can't worry about that, uh, too much more. Um, what Can I, I add something yes, to that? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Lauren, I'm glad you brought that up because I, just like you said, like old music that I used to know, I hear it. I know what it is. New music. I like, I can't tell what's going on. I can't pick up a rhythm hardly I can't like it sounds just like noise yeah and um but it's interesting that if it's something that I recommend or recognize my brain will go yep we know what this is and then I can hear it but still not as clearly like you said as you used to but I found that very interesting like somebody so I, I primarily only listen to music that I already know like streaming on my phone if I'm in the car or some if there's music playing somewhere people will say oh you know this song and I'm like I can't even tell you what that is or if that's a man or a woman singing I just it's just so interesting yeah if you're like me you've had to make some decisions about what you're going to grieve over or what you're just going to move forward and some of things will never be the same and some things are better when we think you um you know discovered uh, you had well you had some sudden hearing loss that happened quickly and and um Surprisingly, we're starting to run out of time. And I want to know, uh, we talked a bit about devices and it sounds like you, Jill, do use streaming. I, I personally, right now, I'm streaming through my mini mic and my mm -hmm. phone and my this and my that, and I'm getting an upgrade. I wear a cancel and off the ear and I cuff it to my ear. I'm getting an upgrade shortly and then I'll be able to stream everything uh, through the phone, which would be great. What devices do you find really useful uh, for hearing with your cochlear implant? The only thing I use is the phone because I honestly, all that other stuff, it's very confusing and overly complicated to me. It like, I have the TV streamer that I have tried to connect like five different times and it just doesn't work. And so I just use subtitles for my TV, I would like to be able to do that. Um, and then the mini mic, I know, I think that's something that I should probably revisit, but you know, the, uh, the ability to place it at the far end of the room and hear people better at that side of the table, but I, I haven't. So honestly, my phone is really the only device that I use. I should, I should explore that more. Lauren, do you use, yeah. utilize those things? No, they, when I had my hearing aids, they try, like hearing aids, not, cochlear they tried to like sell me up when I had like like 10 different devices yeah. and <laughs> too many things to like I'm like this mm -hmm. is I'm just gonna function I don't need to rely on technology this much yeah. but the only thing like you said is the phone like I I thankfully can use um like if somebody calls me for the most part I can understand them on my on my cell phone and I think it's so cool because nobody else can hear that's some cutting out here no. or yeah. can hear like the voice so I feel like a super spy because I can just like hold it over here or I'll forget I'll be like in target and like I'll leave my phone in a different aisle and I'll be talking yeah. to my husband about something else in a different aisle <laughs> it's a whole thing but yeah like thank goodness for that like bluetooth technology they have because I it's just so incredible so incredible Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And it will only continue to get better uh, with devices. Uh, so I, the, the, the mini mic, I think in your work on the ranch, that was helpful uh, in restaurants. I clip it on to uh, your partners or your communication partners thing, but it just means I have to mm. go into different modes. So let's just, I just going to um, just ask each of you, if you just sum up for us, um, what, do you regret getting your cochlear implant? Are you happy? What final words, what would you say to someone who is considering a cochlear implant? I would say, 
you know, research it, know what you're getting into, because I have heard stories of people who go through it without a lot of research, and then they're not that pleased with the results on the other end. I am, I just, I would just say research, know what you're doing, talk to your surgeon, talk to your audiologist, talk to other people who have them. Um, but for me, it, like I said, it has made all the difference in the world for me to be able to, you know, hear birds and, and like you mentioned, you know, my horse eating hay or even my dog, you know, breathing as we're hiking next to me. Um, so I, I would say just research and, and, and then once you get it, you have to work at it. That was the other thing. It's like, you don't just get it and turn it on and you hear perfectly. Like I spent hours every day, um, trying to retrain my brain and practicing. And I still will sometimes take my hearing aid out and just try to focus on my, you know, implant it. Cause I, I, I think I just can continue skill building on that side. So, um, it's, it's not easy. Um, but to me, it's very worth it. Yeah. Um, I, I would hang on to those final words as well worth it. And thanks for that because it, what you went through is so true. And, mm -hmm. and what, and what about you, Lauren, what would you say to someone considering getting a cochlear I think, implant? I think the same thing. I mean, like, um, I just care so much about, I mean, anybody can cut you open, but like, I, as long you just have to like, I totally believe in like feeding energy from other people. Right. So like I met with a surgeon. So I was like, don't, like, I, I can't do this. I'm never going to be able to do this. And then finally, when I felt comfortable again, and when I met with the other guy, I was like, oh my gosh, you get this. So just like you said, like, just find somebody, just be, you just want to be comfortable. And I definitely, like, I am on the other side of the spectrum. I'm scared of research. <laughs> I just kind of want to be like, like, I just want to trust the doctor. Just tell me what I need to know. I'll do it. Um, uh, I just like, I, I don't know, it might be like self-empowering or something, but um, yeah, I think just like, as long as you feel comfortable with the person, you can like, I don't want us to call it shop doctors, but I mean, just find someone that you feel comfortable going under with and who can really like, luckily my surgeon did walk me through the process because I had those like PT issues and, and the vertigo stuff. Um, so find someone you believe might be able to help you walk through that just in case. But um, I mean, for the people who have nothing to lose, like if, if your hearing is really that that far gone, like mine was like, just do it. It was the best decision I've ever done. And I'm so thankful that I can just communicate regularly and I don't feel, I don't feel lost. I mean, at, when I was 25, I mean, I, and having a son, there's no time. I mean, I would love to learn sign language and it would be great, but having already been hearing, it's like, I, I just can't do that. And I just, I'm so thankful that I went this route and can just function again. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I want to thank the two of you uh, for joining us uh, and discussing it because it's showing both sides of the coin. And uh, when you're used to hearing, when you've had your hearing and you lose it, um, yes, you're going to do what you can to get it back. So so I thank you very much for joining us in this week in hearing. And uh, we look forward to talking to you next time. If you have any questions, I'm Gail Hannon. You get in touch with me at um, hearinghealthmatters.org. So thank you very much.